But we were never in any sort of novels, history books, nothing. It was like we were an invisible people that did not exist. And from the time I was a young girl, I knew I wanted to become a novelist, and I knew I wanted to tell this story. So I'm going to read a section of the book. Luz comes from southern Colorado. She's an indigenous Chicana of mixed ancestry. And after her Belgian father abandons the family, she comes up with her brother Diego. He's a snake charmer. <laughs> and they come up to Denver in the 1930s. So I'm going to read a section from the novel where Luz is remembering when they first moved back or when they first moved to Denver. Um, so she's 17, but she's looking back. So she's about eight years old in this memory. Justice cannot see, but can she hear? Denver, 1934. Sometimes Luz thought about when they first came to the city, how she didn't understand the layout of the world. She was only little. Before, when they had lived in the lost territory, she was surrounded by mountains from Huerfano to Trinidad and all the mining camps in between. The mountains were permanent yet shifting, ancient though young, their white peaks reminding loose of gray hairs while their aspen groves resembled veins. Luce felt partly made of family, as if the land was family. But the city was different. Smog and concrete, morning light spilling between stone squeezes, landing on the worn hoods of model tees resting on Curtis Street. In the evenings, the sun slipped behind the mountains, sinking away with long tentacles of light, reaching over the brickwork city, for another chance at brilliance. Their auntie Maria Josie insisted that Diego and Luz learn the map, as she called it, and she showed them around the city first on foot and later by streetcar. She wore good walking shoes and dressed herself and the children in many layers. It tends to heat up, she would say. Another moment, it might hail. The siblings learned to be cautious. It was dangerous to stroll through mostly Anglo neighborhoods. Their streetcar routes were equally unsafe. There were Ku Klux Klan picnics, car races, cross burnings on the edge of the foothills, flames like tongues licking the canyon walls, hatred reaching all the way to the stars. Luz and Diego were once walking downtown when a man yelled, go back to your own country and spat at them from a truck window. They were supposed to be learning the map. It was the first time Maria Josie had sent them off alone. Luz had cried, wiping the stranger's hot phlegm from her tiny face. Diego cursed, held up both arms, but he lowered them cautiously and told Luz he finally recognized where they were. He pulled his little sister by the sleeve of her oversized dress into the market a place called Tikus, a ringing of bells. What happened to the little one? A voice called and Luz saw that it was the older boy, David, the shopkeeper's son, watchful behind the front counter. Diego pointed to Luz's wet cheek and asked if she could please use the sink in the back. She was only eight years old and everything in the market storeroom was unlike anything Luz had ever seen before. Shelves of canned food, sacks of flour, heaps of wooden crates. They must be rich, she thought, scrubbing her face nearly raw with a clean white towel. Where did it happen? David was asking when Luce returned. She pointed to the front door. What color was the truck? David said, stepping down from the counter. He was carrying a baseball bat. He gently took Luce's left hand and walked her to the front door, opening it with a sweeping gesture. Which direction? Luce shook her head. She was done crying now. Embarrassed, she held the towel to her tiny face, trying to hide herself from David. I don't know any directions yet. We got lost today. We were trying to learn the map. David softly pulled the towel away from Luce's face. He smiled when she looked at him. He wasn't a grown-up, but he wasn't a child, and he was tall and slim-shouldered, a warmth in his gaze. He motioned down the wide avenue between the brick buildings and wired-filled sky. See that, he said. 
Those are the mountains. They'll always be west. Luce looked to the horizon, allowing this line of sunlight to bathe her eyes. And over there, he said, it's flat. That's the prairie land, east. David pointed to the mountains once more. Which direction? West, said Luce. David gestured right. East, said Luce. Good work, David said. Now say this. This is my city. Luce didn't say anything, and David nudged her to go on. This is my city, she said quietly. This, David said louder, is my city. Luce giggled before sucking in another breath. This is my city. All right, said David. Now once more like you mean it. This is my city, they yelled together until their voices boomed high and arching, rattling streetcar cables and smoggy windows, soaring between stone tenements and factory tufts. This, she repeated, is ours. First of all, I'm so excited that we are your first uh, live New York bookstore appearance, Ooh. right? <laughs> I'm also so glad that you read that um, that section because I feel like it gives us a sense of the space and also a sense of the body, right? Everyone's nodding. Yeah, a sense of the body and the and the sort of smallness against that specific landscape, that specific city, which you know so well. Um, in which we haven't seen a lot of, one of the things that when you just said this, I just got curious, you said this story has been in you, you always knew you wanted to write this story? Yeah, yeah, from the time I was like a little baby listening to stories, I was like, I'm going to put this in a novel. <laughs> it's going to be a novel someday. <laughs> <laughs> was it a single point that you were like, this is going to be a novel, I'm going to build it around this, or was it just the family, was it all of the stories together? I think it was a combination of loving books. Yep. So I was a voracious reader. I was a very sad child. I, I felt really lonely, and there was a lot of chaos in my family and in my household and my community. And I read books just like they were going out of style because they made me feel really safe. Mm -hmm. I could take them from any house that I was in, any bad situation, and I could lock myself in a bathroom or hide under the bed, and I could read. And when I was little and I'd hear all these oral stories, it just seemed very natural that these should be in a book because that was how I was receiving a lot of storytelling. Mm -hmm. So it was this combination of like, my elders were these like wonderful mystical people, uh -huh. but I realized like, oh, you're not in the boxcar children. Like you don't <laughs> exist in these books. So I just, I knew we needed to be in books someday. It's such a huge task in a way to put what matters so deeply in, in you into a book. Which scene came first for you? That's a very good question, and no one has asked me that, Mira. Wow, you're like, a, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> this Freudian situation over here. Um, <laughs> when my, um, my great-grandmother was abandoned by their father, he was a Belgian man. He never married their indigenous mother. This was in southern Colorado. Um, and when they would tell the story, it was both my great-grandmother and her sister, my auntie, when they would tell the story, um, I knew that, that that was sort of the seed. That was what gutted us. Um, she would slip into a French accent, and it was just like this incredible cinematic moment. And the reason why I think she told that story over and over again is because that's why they had to leave. That's why they had to come north to the city. Mm -hmm. They weren't able to make a living. This is the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And this white man had come and gotten this indigenous woman pregnant and then left her with all these children. And in many cases, that would be a death sentence. There's no way to afford food for your children. There's nothing you can do about it. But these women in my family, they would not put up with it. And they walked north. They came north. And I remember listening to that story. And when my auntie would tell it, I just, I can, I'll never forget her sitting in her little chair in her recliner and slipping into that fake accent. And, and I also realized, like, her dad never taught her his language. Like, that's the reason why she's slipping into this accent is because that's all she could do. Um, wow. But it was a big wound for my family. Yeah, 
That's that's amazing, and also I can um, now I can sort of trace the wound now in the book, knowing the the book and kind of and having moved through it. I'm really curious about Luce, which you in, you introduced us to us, her mm -hmm. here, right? Um, but there's something kind of amazing. So Luce, you find out, and I'm not giving you any spoilers. Is um, <laughs> she's a seer? Yeah. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about what that means for her in her life? Yeah. So when we first meet Luce. We're at a carnival, it's a chili harvest festival, it's downtown Denver, and she works two jobs. Her main job is that she's a laundress, and she's washing rich people's clothes, and she's doing this all day long. It's breaking down her body, she's only 17, and she already has back aches, her toenails are splitting. So she's already having all this physical labor, but it's not enough. So the other way that she makes money is she reads tea leaves, and this is based on real family history. Uh, my auntie would talk about reading tea leaves for flappers on the street. So Luz has this enormous gift, but throughout the course of Woman of Light, it gets way stronger. Mm. And you balance it. One of the things that I thought was such an interesting choice is because she also is a secretary. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So she is both a seer and a secretary, and I was so curious about that choice in particular. Yeah, so when I was working on this novel, which took over 10 years, uh -huh. one of the jobs I had... Wait, I'm sorry, hold on. This took over 10 years? Yeah. Okay. Were you yeah. writing this while you were writing Sabrina and Karina? Oh, yeah. This was before Sabrina and Karina. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. That's very exciting. Okay. All right. Yeah. So this was... And then Sabrina... I'm just sorry. Hold on. I just... As a writer, like, isn't this curious? So did you break from it to write all the short stories oh, yeah. and then come back to it? And you just kept coming back to it. Oh, yeah. So, like, yeah. I was in this MFA program. Well, the first one I dropped out of. The second one, <laughs> they said, no novels. You cannot turn in your multi-generational epic saga about your family and workshop. And I was like, what? This is all I want to write. And they said, give, you know, give it a try. Try these short stories. And then I found out that I was actually kind of good at those. And I, I got to say that's a fair assessment. <laughs> yeah. Kind of. Kind of. And uh, I got really obsessed with that form. And mm -hmm. so I broke for about three years straight. And I just worked on Sabrina and Karina. Uh -huh. But then it was back to Woman of Light. And so... Actually, like, well, everything was happening for Sabrina and Karina while I was being nominated for awards and I was touring all over America. I was still working on Woman of Light. Um, wow. This is the book that I felt like I was meant to write Yeah, in a lot of ways. Were you scared about the break? Sorry, can you ask me? Were you scared about wandering away from the book when you were making the short stories? Yeah, I mean, how many of us have heard of, like, this curse of the first book? Like what did they call it, the sophomore curse or something? Like if I were a Strokes album, like yeah. the second one might suck, you know? <laughs> no, I don't think it sucks, I think that's a good album. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I was really afraid. I know that there are a lot of writers who have some success with their first book and they don't find the time or the energy to work on the second one. Uh -huh. But I think because this was my original intention, I never strayed from it. I knew that, you know, I was really excited about Sabrina and Karina, and I love it so, so much. It means a lot to me, and it means a lot to a lot of readers. But I actually didn't think that it would ever sell. I didn't think that it would ever be published. So I was putting everything behind Woman of Light, and in some ways, I feel like they're sisters. Mm. And uh, Woman of Light is the big sister, and Sabrina and Karina is actually the little sister. And they're going to take care of each other, I think, in their lives. I love that, I love that too. <laughs> <laughs> Someone just said up here, I love that. I like, yeah. <laughs> we all love that. Um, okay, so you go, you go away, you're writing the short stories. Are there parts of writing the novel that changed from writing the short stories? Like, was there a... Was there a part of the growth? Was there part of a muscle that developed? Or do you feel like, no, they were very separate. They were always very separate practices. That's a really interesting question. So um, one of the things that I found different is that my short stories tend to be long. Mm -hmm. I write 25 pagers, 30 pagers. Um, my chapters are not long. These are eight, four, three pages. And that, I think, was about writing in a module form. Mm -hmm. um, I'm writing a long story that's drawn out over time. There's no way I'm going to have 30-page chapters for you guys. Like, I want you to be able to read this book. And <laughs> I don't want you sitting there going through, like, oh, this chapter four, and it's been 160 pages. <laughs> like, that was never my intention. Um, and I think learning how to pull a story over a longer period of time. So many people love Sabrina and Karina, but one of the big criticisms that I get, which, of course, I get criticism, <laughs> is that they wished those stories were longer and that these were all novels. And I'm like, okay, I cannot write you 11 novels 
<laughs> right now. But um, yeah, so it was about pulling out these stories, mm -hmm. making it longer. Mm -hmm. And I actually watched a lot of TV shows and taught myself how to plot. I did not have a very good understanding of plot when I started this journey. Okay, now we need to talk about that. Which TV shows were you watching to learn about plot? Breaking Bad. <laughs> um, Excellent choice. The Wire. Uh -huh. um, let's see. I think it's that was about it because you watched those twice. And that's taken up like six months. So, um, but yeah, there were a lot. And just thinking about how your chapters need to go. You need to carry people. Uh -huh. You can't just like leave them stranded with a plot point. Like we're going on this journey together. We're going on a walk. Uh -huh. This book is really history rich, right? And I know when you were working on it, we talked a little bit about that. About the weight of the history. About getting it right. About doing the, about doing the research even. What role did that play in your putting this book together? Like, what did you do? How did it work? Did you have to do a lot? And also, did you ever find yourself researching at the expense of writing? I'm not asking for anyone in this room. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. One of the challenges of this book is that it's never been done before, and every, every single one of your books that you want to write has never been done before. But this had really never been done. So when I started researching... I thought I could be like a normal researcher and go to the archives and go to the museum and say, how did I become a Chicana of mixed indigenous Filipino and Jewish and white American ancestry? And they would just blankly look at me and they're like, no, I have no idea. I cannot help you. They're not, this is not in the archives. So I started to realize like that form of research, while it could help me, it was not totally going to help me. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I had to really do is interview my elders and get really comfortable with the fact that they're going to die, and I'm going to die, and everybody that we love, it's all going to disappear. And facing that every time you go to research, that was really difficult. But I got lucky a couple of times um, in huge ways. And one of the ways that I got super lucky is that, well, it's not luck, it's, it's because of my family and the kind of people they are. My mother is a writer, and my mother really worked hard to retain the family stories before my great-grandma died. My great-grandma died when I was around 9 or 10 years old, and I found an old family video where my mom interviewed my great-grandma. And at one point, I'm like dancing in the background. I'm like, oh, I'm not famous, grandma. And she's like, get this girl away from me. <laughs> um, but she, and my mom asked her questions that would become seeds for a lot of the scenes. So she would ask her, how did the family get north? And she would look at the camera and she'd say, well, your Auntie Mary, who Maria Josie in the novel is based on, mm -hmm. um, she was attacked. She got pregnant by a white man. He wouldn't take care of the baby. And she said, enough is enough. And she walked north to Denver. And she hitchhiked along the way. Once she got to Denver, she no longer dated men. She lived her life as a butch queer woman. And that's the matriarch of my family. And that's the matriarch of this novel. So there are all these incredible ways that I got really lucky yeah. because the oral history had been retained. So another thing I'm trying to do with this novel is I want everybody to know how important keeping your stories are. It's really important that you talk to your elders, record them. Um, if you don't have a relationship with them, talk to your neighbors, you know, like just get these stories because it's all going to disappear. And if you come from an oppressed group of people, it's really important because the oppressor will try to wipe out our stories. Mm -hmm. It's one of the functions of colonization. Mm -hmm. I often think that one of the reasons that I started writing was the sense that everything was disappearing, right? Yeah. There's a reality that you grow up with, there's a reality that you're told, and then you don't see it anywhere around you. So it feels like writing it down preserves it in some way. Yeah. Um, I really relate to that, and it's also what a stroke of luck, and also can you please load the video somewhere so we can see <laughs> well, small dancing Kali. There will be a Latino USA episode with me soon, and they actually are going to play clips from some of the oral histories. Yes! Yeah. I'm really excited about it. Oh my god, that's amazing. That is amazing. Okay, tell me a little bit about the character of David. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. So, um, this is... If you've read my previous works, um, you know that I have very complicated characters. And David is, he's this Greek-American attorney. He's doing amazing things for the community. He's taking on the Denver Police Department. He's helping people get their back wages. He's making sure that people aren't evicted. Um, but he also is really harmful. And he hires Luz to come work for him. And their relationship throughout the novel is sort of the backbone of the plot. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and in some ways, this novel is a coming-of-age story. Mm -hmm. And this is about this young woman understanding that not every person has her best intention in mind. Mm -hmm. And with David, I think I've seen some reader reviews where people think that he's like actually kind of sexy or they're in a love triangle. But to me, this is an abusive relationship. And I think a lot of us have been in these relationships in our 20s and, and earlier than that. And we know what it feels like. So David, yeah, he's kind of a... I'll leave that up to you to decide what you think of David. <laughs> was it complicated? Is it Okay, two things. Was it complicated for you in writing that character, or did you know exactly who he was from the minute he started writing? No, because he revealed himself. Like, uh. when she goes to work for this attorney, you think, like, this is a savior of the community. He's helping people get out of prison. He's yeah. doing all this wonderful work. And slowly, he's, he's sort of just, like, etching away at loose. He's just, like, yeah. scraping and scraping away and beating her down. And... It, I, I, you know, I remember when I started to realize he was doing it. And I thought, oh my god, I made this character? This character is doing this? Is this in me? Can, are we all capable of such atrocities, I guess? It kind of feels like a relief, honestly, to hear you talk about it. Because I do think that it is, it is a recognizable, it's a known known. Somebody who is wildly good for the community and harmful, usually, to women in a very specific mm -hmm. way. Right? Like, we know that person. We've seen that person. We always have to maneuver around that person. Yeah. And you, and you hold the damage so differently every time it happens. Um, I'm not going to spoil the um, book for you, but just just for that, um, sorry, just for that, I felt like it was completely original and riveting. That, you know, that insight alone was fantastic. Um, okay, you said that your mom was a writer, and I want to know if she's read the book. Yeah, my whole family, like, we had a big family book club while I was writing it. No, wait, no, wait. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my family, they're my first readers. So, like, one of my little sisters just this morning, she sent me the very first draft, uh -huh. and it was, like, 2011, you know, and she's sending me pages and pages, and she goes, she goes, your movie, your movie is, like, in this email. I said, you mean my book? And she goes, oh, my bad, I meant movie, or I meant book, but she kept calling it, <laughs> she kept calling it a movie. Um, yeah, my mom has read it. My godmother, she is this awesome queer woman in her mid-80s. Yep. I don't know her to be a reader. She read it twice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and she said that on her second read, she looked up to heaven, and she told our ancestors, look, we got a book about us. Uh, oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> yeah, amazing. so it's, it's been really, and my brother, he, he also read it. So it's, it's good for people who have. Uh, Identify as men because my brother. I didn't expect that woman of light would uh, really capture him, but he had some questions about that ending. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I just I'm curious about this because if I gave my family my stuff to read, it would just be a war. So your family's just mainly supportive. Yeah, I mean we've just been so invisible. We have yeah. never felt like we had a voice. Nobody knew we existed. Um, there was just no mainstream representation of us and yeah I mean what, the one thing that some of my siblings are a little bit uncomfortable by is the fact that I have fans like to them like they don't understand why anyone would like me <laughs> so, like, so they do they support my writing but when they see like my sold out events in Denver or something they're like ugh, cringe like people like her <laughs> those are little sisters though that's, yeah, that's siblings, that's yeah. siblings, yeah. Keeping, keeping it real. Um, I want to talk about your high school teacher. Okay. Can we talk about your high school teacher for a minute? Man, this is, oh, I'm not going to say her name. Okay, um, yeah, so I, uh, I was one of those kids that was a really bad student. I had a really difficult time. I struggled with mental health throughout my life, something that I've mentioned earlier. And I knew I wanted to be a writer. So... From the time I was a little kid, I was like, I'm going to become a writer. It doesn't matter that I get D's and F's and I don't go to school. Like, that does not matter. I'm going to be a writer. So that's actually not what the guidance counselor said. They said, you cannot get into anything. You can't get into college. You can't get into community college. You're going to have to take a year of high school again. And I just still wouldn't take no for an answer. So when I found out that the AP English class was reading full novels, not just excerpts, I went to that teacher and I begged her. I said, please let me in your class. I need to be reading Flannery O'Connor and James Joyce and whatever else you guys are reading. I need to learn. I need this education. And she said, okay, well, I'm looking at your transcript and you really just, you don't seem like the kind of person that can handle this workload. If I let you in, it's a really big favor. And if you mess up at all, you can no longer take this class. 
I was like, yeah, of course. I can handle it. I'm a mature adult person. I'm 17. <laughs> I have very bad crippling depression. I definitely can handle this. No. Um, so it's about two weeks into my senior year. And this guy broke up with me. And I got really drunk and I puked in his car. And, he, and like, I was so mortified and embarrassed. And I slept for like two days. You know, I didn't go to school. Just like lied there listening to indie rock being really sad. Yeah, when I showed up back to school, it was like, it was a big deal because I was showing my face and I knew that there were, there were going to be consequences. I didn't realize that the consequences would be that this teacher would pull me aside and say, you're no longer welcome in my class anymore. And I thought, okay, you know, I started hyperventilating. I said, no, I need, this is like the only class I love. I love learning. And she hands me a paper I had written on Flannery O'Connor. And she said, you might be a pretty good writer someday, but I don't think you're cut out for school. I think you should drop out. Like, I think you should just totally quit school. And I, t I took it as sort of like a challenge. And that day I went home, I dropped out, and I got my GED the next day. And then I enrolled in community college, and then I dropped out of community college. <laughs> and um, that summer I went to Metro State in Denver, which is a Hispanic serving institution. And suddenly, like, I was getting straight A's. Like, I was taking Chicano studies classes, I was taking English literature classes, I was reading Sartre. You know, it was just like this incredible thing. It was fueling my mind. And when Sabrina and Karina came out, I hand delivered a copy to that teacher. <laughs> and, I, and I said, thank you. I wrote, thank you for telling me to drop out of high school. I'm an author now. Yeah. <laughs> and I have not heard from her. <laughs> Um, right? So it's so good, the story. So many levels in the story. I know that we are supposed to take questions, yeah? Um, is that, are you giving me the signal to yes, take the question? Um, so I want to, I would, if you guys have questions, I would love to hear them. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to repeat them for the people on YouTube, yeah. Okay, this is a side note. I run a literary slash art magazine, and I recently interviewed um, Emily G. Prado. She's the author of Yeah. 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 Um, and yeah, you're we, still, yeah. yeah. We talked about the experience of trauma and how we handle it. So I'm readdressing it to you. When writing Women of Light, how did you deal with that? Because I know it's a lot of unpacking of emotions and specifically the thought of your family members dying. Yeah. You know, I think for me, um, there's so much sadness. It's overwhelming for me a lot. Um, I'm not always happy. Like, I know I'm up here and I'm like being very extroverted, but that's not my normal daily life. So if I'm not working through my trauma on the page, it's just resting in me. It's resting in my body, it's poisoning me, it's hurting my mind. And so for me, writing through this is actually a very healing process. I've often said that if I did not write Sabrina and Karina, I don't know if I would be alive. I was struggling so much with binge drinking, um, just very bad relationships. And writing Woman of Light, it just took my healing to a whole new level. It actually became generational healing. It wasn't just me anymore. And I was thinking about what happened to my great grandma, what happened to my aunties, and there's a reason why they told those stories over and over again. Um, and so maybe now, I was actually thinking about this just the other day, maybe now to my, my children or my nieces and nephews and you know my siblings, maybe I don't have to repeat these traumas anymore because it's inside that book. It's sort of like an exorcism. Now it's in the book. But thank you for that question. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, I read Sabrina and Karina a few years ago and loved it and was trying to Google where Saguarita is and was like, oh, it's, where is it? I can't find it. And you know, I did the same thing with the Lost Territory. And I was like, why can't I find it? Because I love Colorado. I've been there a few times. I was like, I'd love to just know it. And I love how your stories bring out something that I couldn't tell just by going like, with my mom and going hiking. And now I have a whole new understanding of the land I visited. And I wanted to ask, like, um, the Sagarita and Lost Territory, they felt so real. <laughs> and then why can't I Google them? So I was wondering, like, how the process of, I don't know, creating these cities or the stories within them, how did you go about that? I just wanted to repeat it for the... Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah. so we were talking about the um, the Lost Territory and Sagarita, these... these Fictional cities, these fictional territories you make that are ungoogleable. Um, how do you go about making them? Yeah, that's such a good question, and you're actually not the first person to say, I tried to Google it, it doesn't exist, but that's because my brain is not yet Googleable. You cannot hack it yet. 
Uh, maybe in five years or so. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I, I was a literature nerd. I read Faulkner. I knew that there were these fictional towns, these fictional counties, and I wanted to participate in that. And one of the big reasons that there are fictional zones in my work is because I'm fifth generation Denverite, okay? So my family has been in Denver for over 100 years. I know every street corner, every alley, every building, whatever. I've been to everybody's apartments. I know what they're all like. But I don't know Southern Colorado as well because that's the place they left. And I thought when I first started writing these books, it's going to be very disrespectful for me as I'm not an outsider. I'm a descendant, right? It's going to be very disrespectful if I come in there and pretend like I know everything about this place. I'm writing realism, very distinct realism. And so it's just not possible that I can write about Southern Colorado in a way that's going to be 100% correct. Uh, despite that, I get so many readers who have family from Southern Colorado who grew up in these little villages and these towns, and they're like, oh, that's Antonito, or I know that that's the San Luis Valley, or that's Alamosa. And so they can see the universality in these towns, even though they're fictional. And when I teach, I love letting students know that you can invent a city. You can invent a town. You can do it with fantasy, with sci-fi, all the other ways. Um, but it's just given me so much freedom in my books. And it's also like these cute little Easter eggs because Sewarita is in Woman of Light. Like, you're going to go to that town again. And I think probably in all the books, we're going to have little forays into my, my towns. So, thank you for that question. Um, over here. Hi, um, my name's Media. I'm she, her. I like to follow you on Instagram. I'm always commenting. <laughs> hey! <laughs> um, but I guess my question is as, you know, like, I'm undocumented, I have DACA, I come from Mexico, I'm indigenous, like, feeling of displacement and all of that. And usually our stories um, are either super traumatic or, like, you have to be a good person because if not, it reflects on, like, your whole community. Mm -hmm. So how did you navigate, like, that pressure that you might have felt, you know, from, like, teachers or something like that? Like, oh, but, like, think about your community or, like, mm -hmm. oh, you have to, like, do this because that's, like, what's acceptable. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think love that's a this question. Much. I love it. So the question is um, how do you, coming from a marginalized and often a villainized, yeah. right, um, a, a, a background that is often made into a certain kind of enemy, how do you then make characters that are complicated, that are not purely good, that have the regular amount of humanity that yeah. other humans are allowed? Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you allow yourself that when you know there's a tremendous pressure to only position yourself as good? Yeah. Well, because you've read some of my books, and you're probably going to read this one, I hope. <laughs> um, you, you might have noticed that I read these like bad, sad girls. Like, they're not good. <laughs> okay? And um, the reason I do that is because I was really... I was lazy, I was, you know, sneaking out, I was drinking too much, I was doing all these things that my family said were wrong. There was always something wrong with me. And I couldn't write a perfectly good person because I wasn't a perfectly good person. Luce is one of the most complicated human beings I have ever met in my fictional brain. Like, <laughs> when I was working on her, I was like, damn girl, you're really making this choice right now? Like, why, why are you doing this? And I think we, we are allowed to have humanity. Like, making us good all the time is flattening us. Um, a friend of mine, she, she recently took a workshop and someone said this made this horrible racist comment and they said that every, every person of color right now can get a book deal because it's hot right now. Oh my God. Oh. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> and, they, and they followed it up by saying, even the bad books. And I was like, we deserve bad books. Yeah. Like we, like how many white people have published bad books? <laughs> a lot. So I, I just think, you know, there's a lot of pressure for us to be the model minority, to always be the model in our communities. But where does that leave our interiority when we do make mistakes, when we hurt each other and we mess up? Like we need to have fictional zones in order to analyze that. Writing loose and like seeing her make these like, terrible, like relationship choices. She makes some really good ones too. Like, <laughs> I'm being a little hard on her. But my little sister sent me like an Instagram meme the other day and it was like, she goes, Luce needs this. <laughs> and, I was like, and she's like, I actually don't think Instagram would have saved Luce. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I, I mean, that's just joyful to like have that back and forth with my sister. And like, you know, we need, we need complicated bad characters, not bad, complicated human characters. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for that question. In the back? Yeah, I just, um, I was wondering about how you plan the structure 
author of the novel because you were dealing with so many different shifting perspectives and then like different timelines, but like as a reader, it never felt like forced. I didn't like see the seams. I wasn't like flipping to the back, like trying to trace the family tree. Like it really flowed beautifully. And that was also happening like with the movie like visions, right? So like there were so many different stories happening simultaneously and then when you get to the end, like that's a really important feature. So I just wondered with how you plotted all of that out and you were talking about plot again. So I'm just and it's a question of structure, right? The, yeah. So the question is, with so many different parts of the story, and with such an epic sweep, and, and telling them so many moving parts, really, how did you make that cohesive? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and I'm, a, I'm just very flattered that you think that, because it was a lot of work in order to make it feel seamless. Um, that's where a really good editor comes <laughs> into play. Nicole Kells! <laughs> When I was first working on these sections that are the visions, you know, that are going back into the 1800s, I was writing them as they came to me. I wasn't following any sort of map. I knew I had the 1930s plot line pretty mapped out, but when it came to the visions, I was just following whatever Wild West stuff these people wanted to get into. <laughs> and then, like, this book had, like, it was chaos. And, like, Nicole had this brilliant idea. <laughs> Why don't we start every part with a vision? And it was just like this key. It just sort of unlocked this, the making this so much readable, so much more readable. People are binging this book. Like, I never anticipated that. And I really think that's when it comes to having that kind of flow, it's because I had a great editor on this book. Um, so thank you so much, Nicole, for making it readable. <laughs> Over here in the flower dance. Yeah, that's you. Oh, me. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, I'm hoping to teach some Sabrina and Karina book uh, stories to some of my juniors next year. Um, and I'm really interested in, you mentioned like Faulkner, and I know you're really um, a fan of Willa Cather. And I'm so interested in this idea of like, as a literature teacher and a, a writer, how, because you're writing into this very new, very important new American voice, like how you see yourself as part of this canon and how you're inspired by like the canon, whatever that means, right? Um, in the very like traditionally lauded books and then your own sort of space and the story that really needs to be told. So I'm just interested in how you like take that inspiration um, and make it your own. Okay, yeah, I like, I like, I'm the interpreter. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> so, the, <laughs> so the question was about um, being both a fan of the canon, being informed by the canon, also knowing that your story has remained decidedly outside of it and never been represented. How do you take inspiration from that and work with it? Oh, that's a really good question, and I think it's, um, I'm glad that you noticed that about me. So I, I have this sort of uh, traditional style that is actually out of fashion. Like, not very many people write realism in the way that I do right now. Um, and I developed that because I was such a big reader. But I knew, like, even when I was reading Willa Cather, I'm like, mm, this is like some seriously messed up stuff you're saying about Mexican characters, about Native characters. Um, and so what I, I kind of think of my work is like, I, okay, have you ever read Woman Light? But there's this character, Lizette. And Lizette makes clothes, right? She makes these beautiful, ornate clothes, but she doesn't break the dresses and sew them all together and create something brand, brand new. What she's doing is she's taking the tradition of like the wedding dress and she's adding her own flair and she's changing it in a way and be making it expansive. When I was in graduate school, it was really in fashion to write experimental prose. And the issue with experimental prose for me and my family was that no one could read that. No one was going to follow that in my family. And I come from the oral tradition. And the oral tradition is traditional. So I would tell my classmates when they would push me to write a bunch of stuff and cut it all up and put it in a bowl and throw it out. <laughs> I said, no, I don't need to be that kind of experimental writer because I am experimental. I am writing indigenous Chicana stories that have never been told before. That's an experiment. And we're going to see what happens. And what happens is that people like it and they can read it. Um, and so I, I do think that I'm very informed by the canon, but I am well aware that I'm doing something brand new, and I just can't wait to keep expanding it. Thank you. Very much. Do we have another? I felt like there was another question that I. 
or maybe somebody, maybe everyone answered it. Um, are we good? Should I wrap it up? I want to give everyone time. Yeah, do you have one more question? We've got one more I do. Okay, I do actually. All right. If I'm allowed to do that, okay. First of all, I just want to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mara. Look, I have so many questions. Um, so you know I grew up in New Mexico, and I just want to say that I wish I would have known you then because we would have had a punk band called oh. Sad Bad Girls. Oh. <laughs> and it would have been amazing. Um, but I feel like when um, when we talk about that part of the country, there is so much that you that there's like an idea that people have about it, and then there's this whole thing that nobody knows. One of the things I love is that you give light to so much of what nobody knows. But what is it that you never see about our part of the country? So somebody asked me what um, my high school experience was like recently. They were like, did you go to like a mostly white high school? And I was like, no. <laughs> like, I went to a school that had like a ton of Chicano students, a ton of native students, a ton of Hmong students, a ton of students from Nigeria. Like my experience in Colorado has been very diverse, you know, and like people don't realize that there have been so many layers of people coming and coming and coming. Like, we had coal mining, we had the gold rush. Do you think it was just like one group of people coming? People want to make money, all people. And so one of the big things that I think I'm fighting against all the time is that this is just not like a white settler cowboy space and all the indigenous people were murdered. This, this is a space where we blended and shifted and we changed and we are something new and we're something beautiful and diverse and I love where I come from, and if you've never been there, I hope you visit it, and if you can't visit in person, please visit in my books. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Kali. Thank you guys thank for you. coming. Just a few quick words for me. Can I echo, echo the big thank you to everyone here and a big thank you to you both for such a brilliant conversation. As a reminder, Kali is going to be personalizing books at that back, back desk. We'll give her a minute to get settled and then folks can start lining up. If you'd like to purchase additional copies of Woman of Light or Sabrina and Karina or a copy of Good Talk, Mira's book, we have those at the front, and we also have really beautiful art prints available with each book purchase. Well, I'm losing my words, so sorry. Um, and if you're still with us on YouTube, you can find the link to buy those books in the description. For those of us in store tonight, we do ask that you please make your way downstairs once, you, once you've purchased those books so that our staff can begin to break down this space. That's all from me, so thank you again, everyone, and let's give these two one last round of applause. Thank you.